Hi, this is the overview video for chapter 3, the first law of thermodynamics. Having covered the necessary background materials in chapter 1 and 2, we are now ready to cover the first law of thermodynamics. And this will be the first step towards our ultimate goal in the remainder of our first four, four weeks, developing tools for analyzing heat engines and their cousins, heat pumps and refrigerators. There are three important pieces covered in chapter three. They are mechanical description of work in working with the gas, the first law of thermodynamics, which relates the internal energy to heat transfer and work done, and a few important thermodynamic processes. We will briefly go over each of these three important pieces. In section 3.2, a derivation is given for describing work in terms of gas quantities, pressure, and volume. In Physics 4a, we defined work as a force times displacement. Using the definition of pressure, you can describe force exerted by a gas as pressure times area. When you combine this area, cross-sectional area, with displacement, you get change in volume, which is where we get this relationship. DW is equal to P times DV. In simple scenarios where pressure is constant, we can just say work done is pressure times change in value, V2 minus V1. But in the more complex scenarios, for example, in a process where temperature remains constant, the ideal gas law tells us that the pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So as volume expands, pressure is not constant. So you have to set up an integral and actually do the integral to figure out how much work is done. There is a tutorial question in your homework set to walk you through an example of this. Section 3.3 .3. On the first law of thermodynamics, it's the longest chapter by far. It's a field with important examples, so please do go through it slowly and carefully. For this video, I will point out that the first law is repeating something you already knew. Energy is conserved. Because energy is conserved, the change in internal energy has to come from somewhere, and it can come from only two sources. It can come from net transfer of heat into the system, and energy can leave the system through work done by the gas. By the way, with the first law, there are different sign conventions out there. For physics courses, the sign convention in your textbook is the most common one. So when heat flows into the system, Q is positive. When the system does work, W is positive. And if someone is doing work on the system, increasing its energy, W is actually negative. You can see that this sign convention, combined with how equation 3.7 is written out, it all works out. So please look through the examples. A good understanding of the first law it will help you with your homework assignment. The last of the three big pieces is the special named thermodynamic processes in section 3.4. There are four special processes given special names. They are isothermal, isobaric, isochoric, and adiabatic processes. They are characterized by having a particular quantity held constant. In an isothermal process, the temperature of the system is constant. In an isobaric process, the pressure of the system is constant. In an isochoric process, 
the volume of the system is constant. In an adiabatic process, the heat transfer is zero. There are some characteristics of each process that follow immediately from these definitions. For example, since the internal energy of a gas depends only on the temperature, for monatomic gases, internal energy is number of gas molecules times uh, 3 halves um, times kBT. Um, so because of that, in an isothermal process, the internal energy remains constant. If temperature doesn't change, internal energy doesn't change. And this means, since the first law says net change of internal energy is equal to net heat transfer minus work done, in an isothermal process, net heat transfer has to be equal to work done so that the internal energy of the gas does not change. In an isobaric process, since the pressure is constant, work done is simply calculated by pressure times the total change in volume. In an isochoric process, by contrast, since there is no volume change, no work at all is done. Finally, in an adiabatic process, since heat transfer is zero, any work done by gas directly leads to the decrease of the internal energy. That is temperature of the gas by the same amount as the work done. In problems, we use these names to communicate any special restrictions set on a process. So you need to know which each of these labels mean. All right, so those are the three big conceptual pieces. Sections 3.5 and 3.6 also contain useful formulas and their derivations. For example, heat capacity over gas depends on if the heating occurs under constant volume, that is, no work done, or under constant pressure, that is, some work done. By the way, when you see an expression which uses Avogadro's number and the idea of mole, which I'm trying to avoid in this class, the way to convert the expression to the version I'll exclusively use is by replacing nr, number of moles, times the gas constant r, with capital N, num actual number of molecules, times kb, Boltzmann's constant. Section 3.6 also derives the adiabatic relationship, which says that instead of pressure times volume being constant, that's the ideal gas law if you had an isothermal process. In an adiabatic relationship, it's a pressure times the volume raised to gamma. Gamma is the ratio of the specific heat capacity under constant pressure over specific heat capacity under constant volume. So it's this uh, pressure times the volume raised to this factor gamma that remains constant. This will be a useful relationship to know when we are later working out heat engine cycles. All right, that covers all the key ideas in chapter three. There will be a couple additional videos to cover some unexpected ideas in chapter three, as well as examples of some problems from your homework questions worked out. Please let me know if there are any questions and goodbye.